who is not the Robert Palmer that just got four years in a uh, prison for his attack on the on the Capitol. Or am not, I? <laughs> no, you are not, and you're not the famous Robert Palmer who is the. Um, no, he's been gone 15 years or so, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, has he really? Yep. Oh, I didn't know that. I I didn't know he was still alive, or he wasn't still alive. Anyway. So the talk we're going to hear next is uh, Robert Palmer, Critical Thinking 101, Inoculating Yourself Against False Beliefs. You have a, a bit of a challenge here, Rob, that you're going to need to kind of up the mood a little bit, which is going to be really kind of hard. But Well, uh, I, do, I don't at least have any horrendous videos in it. In fact, in fact, this is a 20-minute version of an hour talk that I've given before, and I'm going to give it again and tell you about that later as an hour. So this has got a lot of stuff shaved out. All the videos are gone even though it didn't have any horrendous videos like Linda's did, but no videos in this one. Um, I tried to keep in all the main points. I try to keep this to 20, 25 minutes. And um, one point, I created this talk to give to non-skeptics. It, it was for actually recovering from religion. They asked me to create this because they have people coming out of religious backgrounds who are not critical thinkers. So it was originally um, imbued with a lot of comments and uh, examples of how you know, non-critical thinking affects religion. And so I've taken most of that out. Um, but I hope even though most people here are skeptics by nature, I hope you still get something out of it and you learn something. Um, one point is that Linda had some audio issues, at least on my end, her audio was breaking up. So if anyone uh, sees that happen, hears that happening with me, please put it in the chat and then Susan can you know, jump in and tell me and then I'll just shut my video off because you don't need to see my face talking. Um, just yeah. let me know. Sometimes uh, the actually you'll have a little problem here on Zoom and then you'll get over to the YouTube channel and it's fine. Mm. So it, it's just a thing. Just bear with it. Uh, if we end up having a little bit of problem, I think we can handle it. But okay, so on my, on my screen, my my thing is covered with other things. Do you see the whole PowerPoint presentation with no blocks of it? Yeah, no blocks. You're good. Very good. Okay. Okay, so um, I subtitled this Inoculating Yourself Against False Beliefs because like, hey, in the pandemic, I had to. And by the way, I might be the first speaker with COVID. So I have an active infection and I'm isolating. Uh, luckily, I am triple vax, so not so bad so far. What does this talk about? So uh, our brains evolved on the savannah of Africa, right? And then after that, through the rest of the world for a short time, well enough to allow our species to survive. But our thinking organ, which evolved just to first all death until we could reproduce, right? That's how, uh, that's how it works. It's far from perfect. Uh, Understanding this fact, having neuropsychological humility is one key to critical thinking. And that's what I'm mostly going to be talking about. So that term was coined by Stephen Novello. He expounded upon it in the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe book, which I heartily recommend. And here is how he defined it when he actually talked about it in an article in Skeptical Inquirer. Um, I really like this, so I'm going to read it. First, I'm going to hide my controls because I can't read the bottom. Hide meeting controls. There we go. So being a functional skeptic requires knowledge of all the various ways in which we deceive ourselves, the limits and flaws in human perception and memory, the inherent biases and fallacies in cognition, and the methods that can help mitigate all these flaws and biases. I'm mostly going to be talking about the flaws in the perception and memory and the biases part so that we can understand those. Okay, the talk is outlined as follows. There's two main parts, functional limitations of the brain and reasoning errors that we make. The first part's got some sections, sensory input error, the data handling limitations. So the first part is our senses put information into our head, right? And there's limitations to that, the accuracy of that. Then once it's in our head, there's problems with getting it into our head. Then of course, once it's in there, we have to retrieve it as a memory and there are issues with that. Now, once all of that flawed and partial information is in our brains, we have to think about it, right? So we have cognitive biases and logical fallacies which affect the outcome of what we think about the data in our heads. So let's go to the first section, functional limitations of the brain, right? One important aspect of critical thinking or skepticism is understanding the limitations of human perception and memory. In other words, the functional limitations of your brain. People generally understand that memory isn't perfect even if they don't realize quite how bad it is. But they assume your senses, your vision, that gives you an accurate view of the world around us, especially if you don't wear glasses and you have 20-20 vision. The common refrain is, I know what I saw. If, if, if anyone says something, I saw a UFO, I saw a Bigfoot, I saw 
you know, I don't know, the spirit of uh, the Holy Ghost appeared to me. I know what I saw. So the reasons that we can be thinking these things and it not be true is that we don't see the world around us in full or even as it really is. Right? Our vision is unreliable. It's imperfect. Your eyes have flaws that you would never accept if you bought a camera. You bring the camera back. You have a blind spot in your retina where the optic nerve exits the retina and you see absolutely nothing in a fairly large spot. But it's actually much worse than that. The rest of your retina, you only see high resolution in a tiny area in the center of your vision. It's the fovea. If you put your arm out and you look at your thumbnail, it's just twice the thumbnail that's in high res. Everything else is not. In fact, it's not even in um, color for the most part. So that's a uh, cross-section of the eye, very simplistic, but you could see the little blotch, which is the fovea. And if we were to map um, how well you can see, giving one the best possible with the cells there, it's only one for a tiny, tiny bit of that point. And then it drops off very quickly. As you can see, it goes to almost zero very quickly at any radius around. And of course, it's zero at the blind spot. Well, also, as I mentioned, that's where uh, your your actual color vision is. So most of the rest of the part outside that little two thumbnails at arm's length is grayscale. And some proof of this is to support it, approximately half the nerve fibers in the entire optic nerve carry information from that tiny little spot, while the remaining half go to the much larger area all around your eye. So in a nutshell, outside the fovea, your vision is low res, gray, and you're effectively looking at the world through a small tube without the realization of that. Now, why don't you realize that? because the brain fooled you to thinking everything is perfect. It's in high resolution and it's in full color. While the scene is being observed, your eyes automatically subconsciously are commanded by your brain to shift gaze and bring different portions of the scene into focus on the phobia. And then your brain fills all that in. It fills in the blind spot. It, it, it assumes colors where it's not seeing them based on what it sees in the phobia. Your brain stitches it all together in the limited time it has before things change in the view. And that's the view that's presented to you. And then there's another thing, you're blinking all the time. It's approximately 10% of the time that you're awake and looking at things. You're actually having nothing at all fed to your brain. It's black. Like, and you don't even notice this, right? If, if you were watching a movie and every 10 frames went blank or every one second out of 10 went blank, you would absolutely shut it off, right? You don't see this happening in your real world view right now because your brain doesn't let you see that. Right? Your brain's visual cortex combines all the less than perfect input to construct a broad view of the world and it presents that in a highly edited, it's a manufactured reality that you think is perfectly real. It's just a model, it's just an approximation of your environment that's good enough to get by so you don't get eaten by a tiger on the savannah. Right? Also, if something is not clearly seen or it's seen for too short of a time or just it happens to be ambiguous, your brain gets confused but it has to make you think you're seeing something. So it shows you what it thinks it saw, right? This is how all sorts of perceptual errors happen, including optical illusions and, and the like. So here's a fairly interesting one, I think. So, you know, how is that done? Is this done in a computer? Is that, is that a, a computer graphic? Uh, no, it's a flat piece of paper that just happens to have lines drawn on it in a certain way and it's cut at that angle. So that's what it looks like, right? If you just flip it over a little bit, angle the paper down a little bit, now you get a cube instead of a long rectangle. And it's just a flat piece of paper. So this is not a moving image. Most people's eyes and brains will see that as rotating and maybe even get a little nauseous. So close your eyes before that happens. But is everyone seeing that? Susan, are you seeing that move? Yes, I, I am. Yeah. That, slowly, that, very slowly. Yep. Yeah, so if you put your hands up to a little tiny portion of it and just look through the little spot in your hand, you won't, it, you'll, it's clear it's not moving. So your brain is clearly tricking you in some way and it's just wrong, right? So also, if all that isn't enough to convince you that your senses don't actually show you the world the way it actually is, our eyes evolve to only see a tiny, tiny fraction of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Everything else is invisible, but it's just as real as a tiny portion that you can see. This is a graphical representation of that. The top bar shows the frequencies of light from high energy photons, low energy photons, short waves to long waves. And actually the long radio waves go off to infinity. And that little speck in the middle where, where they're showing it in color is all we can see of all of that. But the rest of it is real. You just don't know it's there, right? Other animals can see portions of that spectrum. They see an IR, 
uh, other animals, including mammals, in fact, see in UV. Learned that in uh, Susan's trivia a few weeks ago. Uh, no species-specific perception of the world is complete or, in fact, correct, right? And even members of the same species with optimally functioning eyes may experience visual reality very differently. So most people have probably heard of Gate, right? This is, this is kind of a fascinating thing. This was a photograph of a dress that became an internet viral phenomenon um, six years ago, seven years ago at this point. Actually, there's a Wikipedia article, of course there is, the dress. Uh, viewers of this image vehemently disagreed about what color it was. And, and it wasn't just a, you know, an internet thing. This was a subject of scientific investigation because like, why was this happening? It resulted in peer reviewed scientific papers trying to figure this out, how our brains work here. So what color is the dress? I can't see the chat, but you guys might want to put that in the chat, what you see here. So there was all different versions. Usually it was like, you know, two different colors people saw and they were different from each other. Um, so I'm going to now tell you what the correct answer is. You didn't know there was a correct answer, did you? The dress has no color. So that gets a lot of pushback when I tell people that, but at least it doesn't have color like it has volume, mass, temperature, and any other real property of matter, right? Color is quite literally a figment of your imagination. It's just a computation that your brain makes to try to differentiate the wavelengths for you, right? It tries to extract meaning from the world. And as you saw, not every brain computes it the same way. Susan, do you have a pop-ups on my screen? Because I do, with somebody in the waiting room, et cetera? Nope. Okay, somebody's in the waiting room, by the way. Nope. So it, it is a fact that color only exists in your head. There is such a thing as light and there is such a thing as energy, but there is no such thing as color. This is from a neuroscientist. And at the bottom is the name of the article that he wrote this in shortly after it started to be studied because people did not believe this fact. So our other senses such as hearing also have limitations. Right? Some animals' brains use means other than vision, sonar echolocation to map the world. And they have an entirely different view of reality than we do. Which one's right? right? Does a bat's brain map surface texture as color? Maybe, maybe rough as red and smooth as orange. Um, and again, not all members of one species agree on reality. You may know, have heard this. So put in the chat what you heard. I'll play that one again. So this is another one of those things that the uh, brain. Just... Oh, yeah, the did noise. you not? No. Uh. -uh. uh oh. Okay. So that means I did not check share the Yanny! chat. <laughs> no, or Laurel. No. Laurel. All right. Yanny! Laurel. Of course, I don't see any place where it says to share the sound. That's right. Share sound. Okay. Here we go. Laurel, Laurel, Laurel. You hear it that time? Yes, Susan? yes. Okay, so put in the chat what you heard, because the first time I ever heard this in real life was in my office environment, and it started fights, because some people thought that we were <laughs> lying to them. No, it's only what I hear. What are you talking about? It's not that. You're pulling my leg. Stop it. it was <laughs> amazing. All right, so now we're going to go through the second section, data handling limitations. So now that all this fundamentally flawed information is, is in your brain, well, how did it get there, right? It doesn't go there at the speed of, well, it doesn't go there at the speed of infinity, right? You, you have, there's a speed of light, it, your brain and your retina, electrochemical processes. So there's a lag and there's problems like that. Only so much information can be handled at a time, right? Your brain actually ignores much of what the eyes and the senses are sending it. And there's a, a problem of attentional limitations. The processor, the CPU, can only handle data at a given rate. So much of what happens around you is actually ignored or not even remembered. When you're driving down the road, you're focused on a car in front of you, maybe on the side if he's getting close. You don't see all the signs. You can't read all the words and the signs passing you. If you were looking at them and concentrated on that, you would, but then you'd have an accident. So your brain knows not to do that, right? There's a thing called inattentional blindness. It's a failure to observe visible objects in a scene right in front of you that you are looking at, but that you don't see them because you're distracted. Uh, these are rendered effectively invisible. There's a famous example I have in the longer talk about the people 
of in white shirts and black shirts passing a basketball back and forth. And you're supposed to count how many times the white team passes the basketball to each other. And you don't see the gorilla walking across right in front of you. Uh, there's a thing called change blindness. It's failure to notice changes in a scene as they happen. Uh, and this is in that same one, there's a curtain, which is the backdrop of the entire thing. It actually changes color from gold to green or something like that. Full screen and almost no one ever sees it happen. So that's failure to notice changes as they happen, right? Basically your brain sees everything is not equally important and it just doesn't see or remember much of it. So now you have this flawed information that got into your brain at less than optimal processing speed and all that. Now you're trying to remember it, right? So now we're talking about memory issues. I know what I saw, as I mentioned before, everyone says, and they also say, I remember it like it was yesterday. Well, the problem is that's just as wrong as I know what I saw. Human memory is imperfect and it's unreliable, right? Your brain is not an organic recording and playback system. Can you accurately remember what something you've seen numerous times look like? Most people say yes, but they're asked to draw a dollar bill or a bicycle and they get it fundamentally wrong. I'm gonna give you just one here. Can you recall what the Toyota emblem looks like? A lot of Toyotas on the road. This is what people, you know, in a random sample of this kind of testing did. Like some are more wrong than others, but none are, none are actually right. And uh, that's the actual symbol. And that's a typical thing. It's because your brain sees it, it, it stores it, well, that's Toyota, but it doesn't really commit it to memory because it, yeah, it doesn't matter, right? The brain retrieves bits of information from past observations. It stitches them all together, fills in the gaps as best as possible. It feeds it to you as a cohesive story, like this is real, but it, it isn't. Uh, a show that I loved on that, on that Geo, Brain Games, had eight seasons discussing this kind of stuff. It's worth looking up. Elizabeth Loftus, who, who spoke at PsyCon, and I got to interview her for the Skeptic Zone, talked all about her experiments to show that people can be made to remember things that never happened to them, just, and those memories that are formed by her experiments are just as real to them as the things that actually did happen to them. So given all that science has revealed about poorly we see, poorly we remember, it makes no sense to trust anyone's memory of what they remember as an extraordinary event, paranormal, supernatural, decades ago, last year, last month, or even a minute ago. Turns out yesterday I was watching the, uh, the show Truth Wanted, it's also a podcast from the Atheist Community of Austin, and there was a caller in talking about his visit to psychics 20 something years ago. And he's sure that these two psychics a week apart told him the same exact thing. And, and Ross was, Ross, uh, was the um, blotcher from Ono Ross and Kari was the guest host. And he, and he told him various ways that he could be wrong about that. And one of which was his own experience with Carrie. They visited a psychic medium and then reported on it. And I listened to that episode a long time ago. Ross said, oh yeah, she got one thing right. She came over and she told me my grandmother's name was Clara. I don't remember if that's a detail, but basically. And then Carrie was looking at her notes. No, she didn't. She said her name could have been da, 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 and Clara. And Ross did not remember that. And they were there to evaluate this. So can you imagine just a regular person going to a psychic? So the main point here is, uh, you know, the phrase attributed to Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And it should be obvious that any claim based exclusively on senses and memory does not come close to qualifying as extraordinary evidence, especially when you're trying to, you know, prove something paranormal or supernatural. And yet, these famous lines all have one thing in common. Play it again, Sam, mirror, mirror on the wall. Lucy, you've got some splaining to do. Luke, I am your father. Life is like a box of chocolates. Beam me up, Scotty. Does anyone know what's the deal with all of these? What do they have in common? Put in the chat, I'll give you five seconds. See if anybody gets it before I say, and I can't see the chat, so. Yeah, so the truth is none of those were actually said at all, ever in the media that they're supposed to be in. So, um, except if you believe in the Mandela effect. So this is a conspiracy theory, and these are books and videos, etc., on the subject, uh, all named after Nelson Mandela, because someone decided that they remember Nelson Mandela died in prison and never became um, prime minister, president of South Africa. And uh, then when they were told, yes, he did, said, well, that's not the way I remember it. The universe must have changed. And this is now a thing that people believe uh, the Monopoly man either did or didn't have a monocle in different universes. And some people remember it because 
their brains are maintaining the memory of the other universe. Pikachu had a black stripe on his tail. Uh, Curious George had a tail, that sort of thing. And if you think this is just a joke, this was a review in Amazon, there are a lot of them like this, where somebody was reviewing one of the books about the Mandela effect. Right? It's real. I've been on a discover journey to discover the truth my entire life. On that journey, I found out my memories, my life, even my blood type is no longer what current reality said it to be. The Simpsons writers captured this, or this might have just been a meme. I don't know. I didn't see this episode, but here's Principal Skinner. And there's four examples of things from the Mandela effect around him. Uh, am I just misremembering? No, it's the universe is wrong. And that is a total lack of neuropsychological humility. And that is what these people have. So what we tend to think is I know what I saw, I know what I remember, right? But the reality, according to neurologist Oliver Sacks, every act of perception is to some degree an act of creation and every act of memory is to some degree an act of imagination. That, that kind of covers it all. So everything discussed before this point concerns the physiological failings with the design of our bodies. Uh, these are due to how we evolve, they can't be fixed. The only thing you can do is understand those limitations when making decisions about what you think and you believe, right? Now I'm going to discuss the things that you can change because they involve how you process that faulty information, right? Just like the physiological imperfections, our thinking processes or reasoning is also less than perfect but we at least can partially control how we process the problematic data. We can change how we reason, uh, but we need to understand the flaws in reasoning so you know what you can work on changing, right? And the rest of the talk is gonna concern two categories of that. One is understanding what cognitive biases are and also what logical fallacies are. So reasoning errors. So what's a cognitive bias? So that's a heuristic, it's a shortcut in thinking. It influences how we make decisions about what to believe your brain is always using heuristics. It could not possibly look at the world and every single scene make a decision based on what it sees from scratch. Um, it just, it's trying to simplify the incredibly complex world and all the data it has, right? Cognitive biases may lead to perceptual distortions and accurate judgments and logical interpretations, broadly what leads to irrationality, right? They're unconscious, but if we understand them, then we can possibly train our minds to use a different pattern of thinking and improve ourselves. I, I, the, the longer presentation, I go into a lot of these in details, but I'm just gonna skim over them here. Um, some cognitive biases of, of, uh, of note, confirmation bias, I call that the mother of all biases, right? Most people here would know what this is. This is, I already believe something, I'm only going to believe the data or even look at data that already confirms what I believe and ignore all the disconfirming evidence. Motivated reasoning, and cognitive biases are somewhat all connected to one another, maybe. This one's definitely connected to confirmation bias. But this is an additional, if you have a reason, besides what Klaus and Sam were, seen were talking about before, is that you don't want to admit you are wrong um, in general. You might have a really good reason for not wanting to admit you're wrong. Like if you're a company um, vice president, you've got a big bonus for changing the way the company does its, uh, say, I'll say just randomly, um, engineering of, of a Navy defense system it spends maybe millions of dollars company-wide to, to implement it because you were told that it's going to improve your pro productivity by 300%. And then two years later, things are worse. Well, you're never going to admit that things are worse because of that. It's people weren't following it correctly. You know, no one's going to get back their bonus. No one's going to admit they were wrong. So you're not going to look at the data that says, oh, I shouldn't have done that. There's a status quo bias. People like the things the way they are. Um, there's a bandwagon effect. The more people that you know that believe something, uh, I'm going to stay with them. Must be right, right? There's an interesting one that has to do with your brain and your eyes, pareidolia. Most people know that term, right? It's seeing patterns where patterns don't really exist. There's a common one, seeing things in clouds. People with a religious bent would certainly see some image there. Uh, if you're into ballet, maybe it's a ballet dancer. This is definitely has a religious connotation to most people. These, these made the rounds on the internet. And I think one of them actually made money for people because they had a site selling, you know, signed photographs, uh, hypothetically not signed by the people in the, <laughs> in the image. Um, this is a famous one that came up uh, in, well, the science world. This was from Viking Orbiter in 1976. Blew up big time. There's a face on Mars. That means people built it there. That means there's civilization. 
There were books written about the cities on Mars, pointing out to every crater that's a collapsed building. And then we sent an orbiter in 2001, the Mars Global Surveyor, and uh, that's the same feature with a different sun angle and a much higher resolution camera. And no one would have ever said that was a face. So if, if they the Martians intended to signal us by building a face, they did a crappy job. And there's just one that's just wonderful, Chicken Church. Um, so how do you overcome your biases? Well, you have to understand that you have them, right? Everyone has biases, all of us. You have to question what you believe to be true, check for alternate explanations of things, and seek out contrary opinions is very important. And basically base your beliefs on verified facts, not what people tell you. All right, so the last section is called uh, logical fallacies. So this is a big topic in the skeptical world. Um, I, for one, never heard of these until I started you know, looking into this as a skeptical activist. Certainly wasn't taught in my school. Well, a fallacy is the use of an invalid or otherwise faulty reasoning in the construction of an argument, commonly divided into formal and informal. Informal fallacies contain errors in reasoning other than the use of an improper logical form. And a fallacious argument may be deceptive by appearing to be better than it really is. And again, my long talk has, we go into these in detail, but short, quick, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Uh, because of this, then that happens, right? Everyone knows it's stupid to say the, the sun came up because the rooster crowed. But, you know, I had a bad headache and took homeopathy and now the headache's gone. Oh, must have been homeopathy. Uh, anecdotal evidence. Hey, sticking with that subject, everyone tells me homeopathy works. It must work. Oh, popular. It's popular. That's everyone tells me just by numbers. How could a million people who take homeopathy in the United States be wrong? Oh, homeopathy has been around for hundreds of years. I'm picking on homeopathy, but you know what else it's going to apply to. Everything. Yep. Uh, I've actually heard this for religion. Christianity specifically is right because uh, millions of uh, people have believed it for thousands of years. One sentence, two logical fallacies. Uh, now, of course, because something is a fallacy and it's structured like that doesn't mean the conclusion is wrong. Christianity might be right, you know, but it's not, it wouldn't be right because of either of those things. And also maybe homeopathy works. It doesn't, but it, it, it certainly, you know, it's it, just because you use a bad fallacy to prove something doesn't necessarily mean the thing you're trying to prove is wrong. It just means you had a bad reason for believing it. And there's the argument from personal incredulity and ignorance. Uh, the first one, ignorance is, you know, we don't know how that happened. So therefore, God, magic pixies, Bigfoot, UFOs, aliens made crop circles, or personal incredulity, sticking with crop circles. I can't believe people can make things that good and that quickly in the middle of the night. Therefore, aliens. And, and uh, there's tons of logical fallacies on the web. People can look into them here at logicallyfallacious.com. There's 300 of them. I had a set which I produce one a week for discussion with people at work, and then I put them on Facebook at that URL. Um, there is the Skeptic Zone list, which Michelle Bickesmar and Richard Saunders did, fantastic. Uh, there's, there's a set of 40 in two sections at that URL, right? And there's actually a list of fallacies on Wikipedia. Susan, J entered the waiting room. I have a pop-up. So, that's pretty much it. What I hope you got from this talk is that due to our flawed senses, uh, computational limitations, and less than perfect memory, what you think you remember experiencing must always be suspect. This is also true and especially true for claims made by others. And it's especially true, double especially, for extraordinary claims, right? Those which contradict what science has uncovered about the nature of reality. So our natural thinking process is flawed in many ways. It's heavily influenced by a host of cognitive biases, easily subjected to fallacious reasoning. But by understanding that, having neuropsychological humility, we can inoculate ourselves from harm. And like the vaccines, that won't be 100%, but it goes a hell of a long way to preventing you from getting very sick, as I'm currently experiencing. Understanding our fallibilities, altering those that you can by critically thinking will lead to holding truer beliefs and to hopefully making better decisions. So finally, I want to say there's a longer version of this presentation. You can snap this with your phone instead of writing it down at that tiny URL. I, it was about an hour long. And I'm also scheduled to give an updated version for Adrian and We Can Reason on January 6th. For people wanting to look into what else I've written on the subject of skepti skepticism and uh, critical thinking, you can look at my column in Skeptical Inquire or snap that with your camera and follow me on Facebook. 
uh, that's it. Thank you all for your attention. That was really terrific. I'm really sad that we're not going to have time for questions. <clears throat> As I was saying in the chat, if anybody has questions for Rob, they should take them to um, Rob himself. You can also uh, uh, join us uh, for lunch. At, uh, the lunchtime, Rob will probably be around. You can tell be around. About questions and, and, and so on. There's a, there's he's just got a wealth of information. I'm sorry you had to get that down into a little little spot like you did uh, I, I had to cut out a little video from the beginning of the matrix where you know he had a, neo had to decide on the red pill of the building and i said hey if you don't want to go and get you know see reality tune out now and don't watch the rest of this presentation <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway so hang around if you have questions for rob i'm sure i'll be happy to answer them you can follow him on facebook the well-known skeptic and uh, lots of places you can find he's done lots of talks there's a lot of things about him on the internet so thank you so much rob Thank you, Susan, for having me.